missing those words yesterday just uh, made the rest of us who miss them a lot more than that feel a little better. And only the church folk yesterday knew you missed them. <laughs> Sure. Yeah, have your Bibles with you this morning. Would you open them to the Gospel of Matthew? We'll be reading from chapter uh, 17 of the Gospel of Matthew. Stand with me as we read from God's Word. We'll begin reading down at verse 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth not your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. And when he was come into the house, Jesus prevented him, saying, or spake to him, saying, What thinkest thou, Simon, of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? of their own children, or of strangers. Peter saith unto him, of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, then are the children free, meaning this is tribute to Jesus' house. Why should I have to pay tribute? Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast a hook, Take up the, fir, the fish that first cometh up, and when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money that take and give unto them for me and thee. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Bow your heads for a moment. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. As always, we believe it, pray you'll teach us faith through it this morning, and for that we'll thank you. Amen. You may be seated. On this occasion, Peter is approached by the people who collected the so-called temple tax. Matthew is the only one of the four Gospels to include this. But that shouldn't surprise us since he was a former tax collector himself. I'm sure this was of more interest to him than to the rest of them. Figuring that perhaps they might somehow trip Jesus up here, guy asked Peter if uh, Jesus is going to pay his temple tax. So that no one be might, might be caused to stumble and to teach his followers that they need to be subject to the laws of the land, Jesus gave Peter instructions on how he was to get the money to pay their tribute money. Temple tax tribute money was called both of those. Now understand something, Jesus was not a rich man. Like I used to hear Paul Crouch and so many of those prosperity preachers on Trinity Broadcasting uh, say. I don't know what they say now because uh, we don't get Trinity Broadcasting in our cable company, which I, I can't say I miss it. He told Peter in verse 27 that he should take a fishing line. He should go down to the Sea of Galilee and the first fish that you catch, he'll have the money in his mouth for me and you to pay our tax. Now, if the Lord were to give you instructions like that, would you have enough faith and enough sense to follow them? We cannot read of a single individual in the Bible that we don't see how their faith or their lack of faith affected either, them either in a positive or a negative way. Peter was no exception. 
Now we are not told by Matthew that Peter did this, but it must have been quite obvious that this is exactly what he did and that he did indeed find the money in the fish's mouth or I'm sure it would not have been included in the Bible. Now in the Sea of Galilee today, there is an interesting little fish that they call the St. Peter's fish, who they named after this incident. He is an inquisitive little fellow that goes around on the bottom of the Sea of Galilee, interestingly enough, always picking up things in his mouth. I understand that if you go to a fresh fish market along the Sea of Galilee, it's not uncommon to go up to the pal of St. Peter's fish that they have there for you to buy. And if you open one of their mouths, you may find a pop can tab, a rock, a, a piece of metal. Who knows what you might find in their mouth because... This is a trait of the St. Peter's fish. They go around picking up things that they're not going to eat and holding them in their mouth. When you go on a tour of the Sea of Galilee, they usually feed you a St. Peter's fish dinner. Minus the rock, I'm assuming, or whatever it is in its mouth. I know someone who went to Israel and was going to do a baptismal service in the Sea of Galilee, and he was going to do it in his bare feet. But he had to come back on shore and put on his tennis shoes because he said the St. Peter's fish would pick at his toenails, trying to get them in his mouth. <laughs> so without a doubt, it was a St. Peter's fish that Peter caught the little fish that now bears his name. And the fish probably had picked up a shekel, a coin, which the shekel is what they needed, that someone had dropped, and it had it in its mouth. Now, however this miracle worked, whether Jesus knew this fish had the coin in its mouth, and caused him to come over and bite on Peter's line, or whether he caused the fish to pick up the coin, or whether Jesus maybe even caused the coin to appear in the fish's mouth after Peter caught him. Any way it happened, it was a miracle. Next time I need money, I'm going to ask Jesus to go with me fishing. <laughs> See what I find in the fish's mouth. But if Peter would have not have had the faith, and here's the important part of the story, if he would not have had the faith to do what Jesus said and obeyed Jesus, trust and obey, that's what it's all about. If he would not have had the faith to do what Jesus said, none of this would have happened. Saying that you believe what the Lord has said is one thing. Saying, oh, I believe that. Doing it is always another. And there's a big difference between saying and doing. Now God is often handcuffed by our failure to obey Him and by our lack of faith in what he has said. Something we should all be asking God to do for us is to strengthen our faith in him. Anybody feel like you got enough yet? Not me. I believe Jesus is doing today what many who call themselves Christians doing with us like he did back in those days. And you say, what am I talking about? Mark chapter 6, verse 6 says, 
he marveled because of their unbelief, not their faith. He marveled because of their unbelief. I hope that's not what God would say about you. I hope instead the Lord would say, man, I love that way, the way I can put that guy to the test and he comes through shining because he's got faith in me. Our unbelief may have robbed us of many of God's blessings that we desperately need. Our attitude should be like the Father who came to Jesus in Mark 9.24 and said, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. Hebrews 11.6 says clearly, but without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Now there are two kinds of atheists. The first is the outward spoken atheist who will tell you, I'm an atheist. He openly declares that there is no such thing as God. Psalm 14 verse 1 says about those guys, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The rest of the verse tells us why fools say such a thing. It says they do so because they are corrupt. And they have done abominable works. Men like this are trying to fool themselves into believing there's no such thing as God because they are corrupt. And why they want to try to convince themselves of this is that sinners don't want to meet God with all their evil deeds that they won't repent of. So they say, ah, I don't believe there is a God. That makes them feel better than thinking about having to stand before a holy God someday and give an account for why they cheated on their wife. And that type of thing. There are many foolish people on the earth. But the most foolish of all is the one that says, I do not believe there is a God. Well, all the while, he is surrounded by evidence of all sorts, even in nature, that there is indeed someone called God Almighty. Now our college campuses are a hotbed of atheism and liberalism these days. I mean, I almost hate to see somebody go off to college, especially if they have a Christian faith for fear of what they're going to be exposed to there in these days. Students going back to college or even to public schools need to be warned about what they may encounter these days in school. One atheistic professor a few years ago challenged his class to tell him how God had helped during a recent drought that they had, they had had in their area that they'd been experiencing. He said to his class, a lot of farmers got on their knees and they asked God for rain. What did they get in answer to their prayers to God? He asked, no rain. They should have sought help from science instead of God. They should have set up a plane to drop the chemicals on a cloud and they would have got rain, he said. There's no need for God since we have science. Any questions? Christian in the back seat of the class said, I have a question. 
Who furnishes the clouds if there's no God? That's right. Amen. 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 Yeah. That's a question that no professing atheist ever has a good answer for. Who furnishes the clouds if there's no God? A Marine was finishing his tour of duty after serving in Afghanistan and he was going to college courtesy of the GI Bill. He had to take a philosophy class. You know, some there's certain things you have to take no matter what you take up at college. And he ended up with an atheist professor who was always ridiculing the idea of God. One day, this professor, and this guy sounded a lot like the philosophy teacher I had at California University when I was going there. One day, this professor was on one of his rants, and he shook his fist at the sky, and he said, If there is a God, I challenge him to strike me as I stand here. Nothing happened. The professor kind of snickered. A few seconds later, the Marine got up out of his seat and walked to the front of the classroom and with one punch laid the professor out on the floor. <laughs> when the professor came to his senses and got to his feet, he asked the Marine, Why'd you do that? The Marine answered, God was busy protecting our troops in Afghanistan, so he sent me to answer your challenge. <laughs> That's my kind of Marine. <laughs> so there's the spoken atheist, the fool that says there's no God, as the Bible calls them. But there's a second kind of atheist. These aren't near as vocal about their atheism as that philosophy professor. Let's call them the unspoken kind. They might not openly declare that they don't believe in God, but their actions prove that they don't. I think if you know anybody like what I'm talking about. A preacher took a church, and in this church there were two wealthy brothers who were in it. And the brothers always got their way in the church because they were the money guys. That's what usually happens in a case like that. And often the money guys hold the church back and these two guys were no exception to the rule. Well, sometime after the new preacher arrived, one of the brothers died. The day before the funeral, the living brother came to the preacher and said, You know that new fellowship hall that you want to build for the church? Here's a check for the full amount. All you have to do is say at the funeral tomorrow that my brother was a saint. Preacher said, okay, I'll do that. Took the check. So the next day at the funeral, the preacher got up and he got to know this brother after a few months there, and he knew that was not the case, that he was a saint. Brother was anything but a saint. So as he got into the funeral message, the preacher said, before us today is one of the meanest men that ever lived. He was a wife beater. He cheated on his wife. He lied. He gossiped. This was one of the most rotten sinners that lived in this town. But compared to his brother, he was a saint. <laughs> he 
said it, didn't he? So I guess the brother couldn't take the check back. <laughs> the unspoken atheist often makes the spoken one look like a saint. You see, this unspoken kind of atheist, they may even attend a church. They may even have a Bible that they read occasionally. But they're filled with doubts and unbelief and usually lots of sin. And unbelief is the total opposite of faith. In case you don't get it. It's a serious thing. You can't have faith and unbelief at the same time. It's one or the other. A woman was cooking her first turkey for Thanksgiving. Before she served it to her husband and son, she announced now, I know this is the first turkey I've ever cooked. If it isn't right, I don't want anybody to say a word. We'll just get up from the table and go to the restaurant down in the street for dinner. So when she came back into the dining room from the kitchen with the turkey ready to serve, she found her husband and son sitting at the table with their coats and hats on, ready to leave. <laughs> You see, they didn't want to eat a turkey that she had doubts about to start with. Now many of us have become as bad as those unspoken atheists I'm talking about because we're filled with doubts. We're not supposed to be filled with doubts, folks. We're people who are supposed to believe the Word. And if we believe the Word, that makes us full of faith, not full of doubts. Remember, Hebrews 11, 6 says, He that cometh to God must not only believe that He is, but that He is the rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. We might as well not even believe that God exists. If after saying we believe, we're going to doubt that He can do for us what He claims that He can do. I mean, what sense does it make? And Satan knows that we are absolutely useless to God if we live our lives in doubts. I mean, what good are we to the kingdom <coughs> We live our lives full of doubts. For you see, doubt and unbelief literally ties the hands of God. What can God do with somebody who doubts Him, does not believe Him? Now Hebrews 11, that great faith chapter of the Bible, gives us a long list of people that were diligently rewarded simply because of their faith in believing God. Rahab the prostitutes even in there. Because they believed God. Peter also was rewarded and he was taught a great lesson because he went fishing for the fish that the Lord told him to go for. Well, who knows what great things that God might want to do in your life if He could just get your attention and just get you to believe Him and follow His instructions. Simple as that. Do you have enough faith to cast a line if the Lord were to tell you to do such a thing? 
Don't say, oh yeah, I, I do, i got plenty of faith. Don't say that if you won't even tithe, for starters. That's right. Only when we have enough faith to do what God tells us to do, can we count on the Lord meeting our needs and doing great things in our life. And tithing is one thing that He expects all of us to do. I guess from what Bill said, that must have been talking to someone about that in your Sunday school lesson mm -hmm. uh, this morning. And yet many who call themselves Christians don't even believe the Lord enough to pay their tithe in faith. And then they have the audacity to wonder, how come God doesn't meet my needs? Doubting God enough that you won't trust Him in faith to pay your tithe, do you realize that comes pretty close to making an atheist out of you? Remember, without faith, it is impossible to please Him. That's what Hebrews boldly says. But faith and obedience, man, that goes far beyond simply tithing. But there again, tithing is a beginning. Where you, what kind of faith and obedience are you going to have if you won't even tithe? If we really have faith in God, it will move us to do everything else that the Word of God tells us to do. Plus, we will be willing to do anything personal that the Lord asks you to do. You know, there's a lot of things the Lord may ask you to do beyond just what it says in the Word. Now, if He never asks you to do anything, the Word, first of all, what it says in the Word, that's what you're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But, what if the Lord were to call you to preach? Or to go to the mission field? Or, or something like that? Would you do it? Those are the many couple of the biggies that many Christians chew their fingernails and say, oh God never asked me to do that. And many of you would say this morning, well I'm too old for that now. And you probably are. <laughs> but what are you going to do if God asked you to take that Sunday school class that they need a teacher for? <laughs> Or what are you going to do if God asks you to volunteer to clean the fellowship hall? Or to do the church bulletin? Or even to sing in the choir? Or to take a couple tomatoes over to your neighbor and invite them to church? You know, God says all kinds of stuff to people. The question we all must answer when God asks us to do something. And it's not up to me to tell you what God asks you to do other than the things in the Word. Who knows what God may ask you to do? But the question is, do you have enough faith to cast that line? Or to do whatever it is that God asks you to do. Without saying, oh, I feel like a fool doing that. The fools don't do what God asks them to do. No man is a fool that follows the path that God asks him to follow whatever it may be. 
And it's not up to me to tell you what that may be other than to obey this. Maybe I'm talking to somebody this morning that God said to you this past week, why don't you take a couple tomatoes over to the neighbor and invite him to church? I don't know why I felt led to say that one again, so maybe, maybe that was you. Well, if God said that, did you do it? Don't expect him to call you to the mission field if you won't take a couple tomatoes over to your neighbor when God asks you to do it and invite him to church. You know, the little things are just as important as the big things. Amen. Yeah. And understand, taking a couple tomatoes to the neighbor and inviting him to the church, if they were to come and get saved, you might have more success than some of those missionaries have in six months in some of those tough places. How do you label importance? I have no idea. Seems to me that anything God asks you to do has to have some importance to it. I mean, everything that God asks you to do, God doesn't just waste His time and your time. Anything God asks us to do, He has a purpose behind it. A purpose for you. God has a plan for your life. Maybe taking a sack of tomatoes to the neighbor and inviting them to church is a part of that plan. Do you have enough faith to obey? Trust and obey. Don't tell me this business about how you believe God and how you trust God if you don't obey. They go together. Lord, I believe, the guy said. Help thou my unbelief. Remember one of the things that Jesus scratched his head about to the disciples and said, when the Son of Man returns to the earth, will I find faith, he said. Will I find faith? Meaning, he was a little concerned that there might not be much of it even among the people who claimed to believe in him. Well, if God were to call you home today, would He find more than just you outwardly saying, oh yeah, I believe in God. Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, that's fine. But would there be any evidence to back up your claim? Remember, James said, faith without works, dead. without doing whatever it is that God tells you to do, it's dead. He said. Meaning, like my grandpa said, it ain't worth a hill of beans. Yes, we better have some faith. And if we claim we have it, then we better be willing to do, to cast the line, or to do whatever it is that God asks of us. Take your hymnal, and in closing this morning, let's sing that simple little chorus. Most of you don't even need it to sing it. It's number 466. In your hymnal, stand as we sing it together. I have no idea. God didn't give me any inside information. I have no idea what God may be asking you to do personally.
other than I know He wants you to believe Him and to do the things that are in His Word. But if God is asking you to do something else, even something crazy like cast a line in the lake and catch a fish, do as I told you to do, and there it will be. Are you willing to do it? Let's sing it together this morning. And if you're here this morning and God has been asking you to do something and you've been bucking at it, you've been saying, ah, oh, Lord, I can't do that. Well, why not? If God said do it, He knows you can do it. And if you can, He'll give you the power to do it. Why would God ask you to do something you can't do? Start right with tithing. Why would God ask you to tithe if He wouldn't supply the need that you have? And just go right on up. Everything above that. Are you willing to say, yes, Lord, yes, to whatever He may be saying to you this morning? Let's sing it together in closing. If there's someone here, you need to settle something with God. Anything from a call to preach right down to taking some tomatoes to the neighbor. Whatever it may be. If you need to pray about it, our altar is always open. Let's sing it together. Oh.